even though sometimes they don't realize they're doing the same antics as professional wrestlers. But, you know, there's a lot more of these MMA guys that they're taking on the heel role. Look, I mean, look at Conor McGregor. From your time then, I mean, I know you famously also faced uh, The Rock. Did you ever imagine that he would be the biggest movie star in the world and uh, he could be a future president of the United States? Those conversations are going on as well. Well, I mean, but but you, you look at how many professional wrestlers are good movie stars. You've got, I mean, The, the Rock, you know, probably the, the best known one right there, but you know, Dave Batista has done really well with what he's done. You've got uh, The Undertaker's been in different movies. Um, th- th- just There's just a, a number of different uh, professional wrestlers, both male and female, yes, that have been, in, yeah. have been in all kinds of movies because they understand how to take on a role. And they know how to use, again, the, the three basic ingredients are facial expressions, body language, and audio. And, you know, that's what professionals are. And, and, the, and being in a professional scene, you have to realize inside this ring, you are playing to four different audiences. There are four sides to this ring. I can't just keep my back to these people all the time. You got to learn to do something over here, do something over there. I mean, to each side, because you got four different audiences. If you really want to entertain the crowd and get over with the crowd, again, whether you're the heel or the baby face, you have to learn to play to all four audiences. Uh, something you were doing back then is uh, coming out with so many pels, right? And these days, a lot of people have done it. Have you seen how uh, Austin Aries and maybe Kenny Omega have also done it? coming out with all the championships with Don Callis and stuff like that? Well, I, I mean, I've seen it, but they did not have someone like a Jim Cornette with them. Because again, I, I'm not the guy, I, I'm not a promo kind of guy. And and Jim knew this. So again, I, I don't know if it, if it was his idea or the creative's idea, but you know, Jim was attached to me and it was great because he did all the talk and he talked about all the stuff. I didn't have to do it. So I always say that you see how Brock Lesnar, he th- he didn't do any talking. He just went out there and just crushed people. Uh, look look at what Bill Goldberg. I mean, when when I first when I first met Bill Goldberg for the first time, it was out in California. I don't even, don't even remember where it was at, but it was like a little business luncheon. There's a couple other business, excuse me, a couple other businessmen that were going to be there, and uh, Bill Goldberg and myself. Well, I never met him before, so you know we're meeting each other. We're kind of exchanging stories back and forth and, 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 and the business meetings take place. Well, about, I'll say halfway through or three quarters away through the meeting, he reaches over and kind of nudges me on the shoulder. He goes, thanks. I go, for what? He goes, dude, he says, I was you. I watched you in the ultimate fighting championships. I watched how you did those, those crazy antics with your, you know, screaming out loud, stuff like this. He goes, I basically, it, you know, was, was playing a role of you. And I just, I laughed, I go, you did a better job of me than I did of myself. So, I mean, it, it makes you feel good to uh, to hear something like that. I mean, it, he had a, a, a very phenomenal career. No, but, uh, I, I mean, you did pave the way for so many people, right? When you see someone like, say, a Ronda Rousey, who yep. makes it in that world and then comes over to this world. I mean, you were the original trendsetter. You, uh, like... Uh, created a pathway that they could follow and also you brought a lot of legitimacy because you mentioned how some people treat the wrestling business as fake. Uh, Did you experience a lot of that back uh, then in the uh, quote-unquote unscripted world of cage fighting? Uh, Did you, did you, uh, did they look down upon professional wrestling? Well, again, coming from the world of amateur wrestling first, um, I really didn't let too many of my buddies know that I was going into professional wrestling because they would have kind of shunned and kind of looked at it. But, you know, after they watched how I conducted myself, they had no problem because I, the the character that I was 
from my cage fighting days, it, I wore the exact same outfit. I wore the same shoes, the same kind of trunks. And, you know, I even wore gloves and things of that nature. And I wore the same kind of like sweaty t-shirt. So I literally was wearing the same outfit from my ultimate fighting championship days and, and, and was doing it in the professional thing. But I always tell people, my first profession was professional wrestling. So I, I again, as I said earlier, I learned certain psychological aspects. I mean, I had, I had a great time. I was introduced to Al Snow uh, through a gentleman by the name of Denny Cass. Denny Cass is no longer with us, but he was the president of the Michigan Wrestling Club, a freestyle and Greco-Roman wrestling organization. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm born and raised in Michigan, but I went to college out at Arizona State, and then after competing finish up my, my collegiate career, then I, I ended up coaching alongside with Bobby Douglas uh, as well for another five years. So for a decade, I lived out in Arizona and then uh, I basically moved back. I took a job at Michigan State University. So I moved back to my home state. So that's how I went from Michigan, Arizona, back to Michigan. And then, you know, getting involved in, as of the 92 Olympics, a new rule came down from the United States Olympic Committee that allowed athletes to be both amateur and professional simultaneously as long as you weren't involved in high school or collegiate athletics. And I was already well past my collegiate eligibility, so I could have my cake and eat, and eat it too. So I, I jumped into professional wrestling as of 1992. And then by 1994, I jumped into the Ultimate Fighting Championships. Who are some fighters today that you enjoy watching? You mentioned you're hosting a fight night. Well, I mean, there's a... Uh, I mean, every now and then I'll watch different um, things on, on, on YouTube and things of that nature because I'm usually working almost every Saturday doing something. So I, I do miss a lot of the Ultimate Fighting Championships. And, uh, you know, every now and then I'll watch somebody. I mean, you, you've had a lot of different people that uh, that have done well for themselves. And, and I, you know, again, I, then even though sometimes they don't realize they're doing the same antics as professional wrestlers. But, you know, there's a lot more of these MMA guys that they're taking on the heel role. They look, I mean, look at Conor McGregor. What a great heel he is. You know, he's, 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 he was, he's playing the snooty, rich, you know, uh, guy. But when you go back and look at his very first, uh, his very first time being in the Ultimate Fight Champs, he, he won. And he was he was happy simply to have won. He was happy to just to be in the UFC. He was happy to finally be off of Ireland's version of welfare. And but but then fast forward, he's made a lot. He's made, he's made good money. He's invested well to where you know he, he owns a couple mansions in a couple of different countries now, and he wears you know he he drives in Rolls Royces and and, and it just it, he's come a long ways from that uh, humble person in the beginning. But he, he, he understood that if you could stir that crowd, again, in, whether it's in a positive way or a negative way, you're still selling tickets, you're still selling pay-per-views. And, and even the kind of strut he does is a lot like Vince McMahon, right? <laughs> yeah, again, it, it, it just, you know, whatever, I mean, you, you look at, I'm trying to think just uh, a couple of the UFC shows back. I'm trying to think of the one fighter who basically came out as uh, the Undertaker. I mean, literally, he had the hat on and stuff like that as well. He, he was doing an Undertaker entrance. He was uh, using, I think, the Undertaker music on top of all of that. Is so, right. I think. Mean, yeah, I think. Right. Yes, exactly. I, I just. I, I couldn't come up with the name right there, but I, I knew that if I talked enough, maybe you, maybe you could help bail me out here on this one. <laughs> so that's where, I, as I said, I, I watch a particular match. I did not watch that whole show, but I'll watch a match here. I'll watch a match there because I'm, I'm, I'm busy. I like what I do. And, and I continue to work at it because a lot of people, once they reach a certain level, they let, they rest upon their laurels. I don't, I keep, you know, I, I, I basically, I live out of a planner. I re actually refer to this as my portable brain. I have all kinds of cool things that are coming up and continue. So, I, you know, the fact that I started, you know, my amateur career back in uh, seventh grade, 1969.